This is my electronics bench, which is actually not even a bench. It's an old desk that I rescued from a scrap pile about eight years ago. I would definitely file this whole setup under temporary unless it works. And it's been working fine, but it is past time for an upgrade. I've always wanted to have a real electronics bench, but man, are those things expensive. It's just almost unbelievable what they want for one. Luckily, I was able to find this little guy locally. This is a real ESD safe electronics bench made by IAC. The only real problem with it is all I got is the bench. I didn't get any of the cool accessories. And it'd be kind of nice to have at least the shelf that goes over the top. So I figured, what the heck, I'll just buy the shelf. This company still exists. So I uh, looked it up. Yeah, just the shelf is $500. And the only way that they'll ship it is via freight, which costs another $400. By the time you pay some taxes, you're talking about $1,000 for a shelf. I don't know. <laughs> that seems a little excessive. This is an old school company. You've seen the memes about the government paying $600 for a toilet seat. Uh, they're buying them from companies like this. But all is not lost. I actually bought two of these benches. And looking at the, the actual shelf on the IAC website, it looks like they share a lot of components between the bench and the shelf. So it seems to me it'd be pretty straightforward to just hack up this bench and make the shelf that we want. I don't really need two benches anyway. Yeah, let's see if we can figure out how to do that. Cut it lengthwise down the middle. Take the legs, chop them off. Take the middle support, chop it in half, cut a chunk out of it, screw it back together, attach it to the top. Boom, shelf. But what about your time and effort? Am I doing anything? Are you doing anything when you start cutting and slicing and cursing and welding? All right, well, foolhardy as it may be, I'm going to continue with my plan. Okay, well, I am not supporting you. But you may have to help me. Until I have to come help you. But I'm just going to constantly remind you about how you, this could have all been taken care of with one speedy delivery. For $1,000. Speedy delivery. All right, well, gotta do something. So I failed to make a video about this, or that, or that. So we're building an electronics table. We? Oui. The royal we. Oui. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that you understand that I, it's the weekend, I probably will not be out here. It's Thursday. <laughs> and tomorrow's the weekend. <laughs> All right, we got the super fine plywood blade. Hopefully, you can cut this without much tear out. That's pretty good. I mean, as far as tear out goes, that's not bad. The only problem I had is that I should not have put masking tape on the bottom. Because as soon as I started the cut, it just wanted to roll over onto itself and then stick to the, to the table saw and I couldn't hardly push it through. Other than that, it worked great.
I 3D printed these caps, which I can screw to the top of the workbench. And then these legs slip over the caps. And we'll screw them in from the side. Then to attach the two beams together, I 3D printed this bracket, which is gonna slip in here. We'll drill some holes and bolt it. Unfortunately, there are welds here, which I didn't account for. So we gotta make ourselves some clearance. That'll do. Bolt holes even line up. This is fantastic, but it gets better. In one of life's fun little coincidences, it's exactly 64 inches between those two legs. And these pegboard panels from wall control are just about 32 inches wide. So I should be able to fit two of them in there, maybe with a little bit of massaging. You wouldn't think it would work to tap threads into a 3D printed plastic part, but as long as you get the diameter right, in my experience, it works pretty well. Maybe not for repeated use, but for one time or a couple of times, it works just fine. Beautiful. It looks good, really good, but it gets better. Check this out. Huh? Huh? Pretty spiffy. I mounted some power strips and I got this handy magnet. Should stick there like so. I might even put some screws in it just for fun. And wall control sells all these little doodads you can attach to their panels. Not a sponsor, by the way. I bought all this stuff. But if they want to be, you know how to get a hold of me. I'm gonna put that about there, maybe. Huh? Pretty cool. Cool. I bought these bins too, but I forgot to buy the brackets that actually hold them to the, to the panel. So we'll have to hold off on that for right now. Those things are beefy. I don't know what I'm gonna put on there, but 
I think they'll hold it. I would like to point out that it is still the weekend. Oh, no. Okay. It's not the weekend, it's Friday. <laughs> and we are clearly already ready for bed. I can lift it. Yeah. Honey. <laughs> now you should be able to lift up and slide. Yes, I do have a pencil sharpener, and it's pretty nice. Which way is it going? They work really good on carpet. They work really good on carpet. Whoa. Doesn't that look snazzy? I love it. Well, I don't think anybody's ever asked me how to set up an electronics bench, but I'm going to tell you anyway, at least I'll give you my opinion. Now you're definitely going to need some sort of soldering tool. Can't go wrong with a Weller or a Heiko. If you're going to buy an off-brand, just make sure that it uses tips that are compatible with Weller or Heiko. These are consumable. It's a lot easier to get those. This little guy is pretty handy for cleaning your tips. Of course, you're going to want approval from Colonel Lincoln, the soldering salmon, or as I'm sure you would pronounce it, Colonel Lincoln, the soldering salmon. Plenty of those available on our website. Of course, you can't solder without solder. This is rosin core electronics solder. Make sure you get the, the real small stuff for doing small components. Come on. And then this is Flux. I like these Flux pens. That's RMA Flux, works pretty good for most things. And then soldering almost inevitably leads to the need to de-solder. So this solder wick is pretty handy for that. And then I really like this low temperature solder. Really helps with like ICs and other surface mount components. Gob some of this stuff on there and you can pretty much just pull them right off. You're gonna have to hold, that thing just will not stay up there. Uh, there's all kinds of tools for holding circuit boards. This little stick vise is pretty handy and they're not very expensive. And then I would highly recommend some sort of fume extractor. Soldering makes all kinds of nasty smoke and you don't really want to be breathing that stuff in. That's isopropyl alcohol. Works really good for cleaning up flux. Now I'm going to assume that you have the basic hand tools, but some specific ones for electronics would be like these flush cut pliers. These are made by Exolite. Fantastic. Get yourself some tiny precision tweezers. And then those are four-in-one screwdrivers. The small one, this is made by Klein. That's fantastic for working on circuit boards, you know, trim pots and terminal strips, that kind of stuff. This big gray mat here is also for ESD protection. So it keeps the static electricity from killing your electronics. And there are wristbands you can attach and it's supposed to be kind of bonded to the ground. I haven't done that yet. You're going to need at least one DC power supply. This one goes from 0 to 30 volts, 0 to 10 amps. That's a pretty common range. This is just a no-name. But it's worked fine for me for at least 10 years. Get a hot glue gun. Those are super handy for working on circuit boards. And then at some point, you're probably going to want an oscilloscope. This is a Rigel. I bought this one because Dave Jones of the EE blog, he, EEV blog, whatever it is, he recommended this as a good scope uh, 10 or 11 years ago. I don't even know. Uh, they've only gotten better, faster, and cheaper since then, but this thing works great. The best part about it is it has this auto button right here. You hook it up to something. If you don't know how to set the scope, push the auto button 
and most of the time it will figure it out for you or at least get you pretty close. So oscilloscopes are kind of like 3D printers. If you've never used one, you probably don't think you need one, but as soon as you use one, you'll find all kinds of uses for it. You're gonna want a multimeter, of course. I would recommend getting one that has auto ranging. This is a fluke, but it's pretty much the cheapest fluke that you can buy. Works great. And then you're gonna need some leads. You really just cannot have too many. This is actually probably only about a fourth of the leads that I have. There's scope leads and just alligator clips and little ones and big ones. And just trust me, you can never have too many. That's the basic setup. That's the stuff that everybody should have. And then from there, you know, it just depends on what you want to do. That's it. I know this won't be a real banger of a video, but it's part of the process of, of keeping things moving around here. So thanks for watching. Uh, God help me. We're going to finish the Malibu engine swap next week. It's, it's been a struggle. Oh, it was sweet. I missed it. That's a bald eagle and he just grabbed a squirrel. He's about to have himself a little snack. <laughs> there he goes. Good